October 28, 1978, 48-year-old Gail Webster was murdered in her Troy home. And since then, the case has been unsolved. And the Troy Police Department right now is doing something extremely unique and forward-thinking and hoping to be able to bring closure to uh, her family and get this mystery solved and find the person or persons who did it and bring them to justice. Right now, we want to bring in Megan Leeham. She is the sergeant over at the Troy Police Department. It's so great to have you. First, let me just, before we get started into the cold case, I feel like you guys are the um, epitome of law enforcement and your ability to use your social media accounts. You guys are doing an amazing job and connecting the police department with your community and not just your community, but really people around the world. Thank you. We, we appreciate that. I think our chiefs um, have had the, you know, we're forward thinking in the past, let us get on social media early and then let us do some creative things. So we've been lucky to be able to do that and get community support too. So with that and being creative, let's talk about this new effort that your department has taken on and trying to solve this cold case. And one of that is trying to utilize your social media and able to bring this family some type of closure. Tell us a little bit about the case first and then how social media is playing a part in this. Okay, so this case has been, it happened in 1978, like you said, 42 years, it'll be coming up on the 42nd anniversary at the end of the month. Um, Gail Webster was a 48 year old woman. Um, she was found on a Saturday morning at 6 a.m. by one of her adult daughters. She was uh, beat to death in her apartment, um, Somerset Apartments. There has never, uh, the case never, you know, really never got a great suspect. There's been a lot of different suspects along the way, um, but we're just looking to draw attention to it. Uh, there's a few different things that happened along the way. Um, one of the one of the key things that I focused in on this case is that it never got a lot of media attention. I don't think back in the 70s, the police went to, or the Troy police at least, we didn't go to the news and ask, can you help us get the word out there? So I think that opportunity was kind of lost in the late 70s and maybe we're trying to make up for it a little bit now. And tell us a little bit about how you're doing that and why you think this could be the key to helping you solve this case. So you know, um, we think there's someone out there that knows something about this. The person or persons that did this, they're, you know, this might be the time they want to come forward and clear their conscience. But also, you know, surely somebody said something to someone, somebody saw something and has just been thinking about it for all these years. So we thought we can use our social media to um, push this out, try and get some attention that it didn't get in the past. Um, we've also been working with the media, um, which has been great. They've really helped us get this story out. And I think we're gonna do a few more things before the month is over to help um, you know, get this in the public's attention. Um, our social media, we've had a big reach. Um, I think it really blew up when we got our police cat a couple years ago. So we were looking for something we could do with our social media reach um, to help solve a case, to do something really good, make a positive impact on um, of the victim's family, the community as a whole. So this has been, a, this whole genre of trying, the public trying to help solve some of these cases has really kind of taken off in the, in the past few years. I mean, before people were maybe going to message blogs, I remember working in Toledo, with the Father Robinson case and the victims of the sexual abuse by priests. And there were a lot of underworld blogs where people were contributing. But I think this invention of social media is going to kind of take this to the next level. But one of the things I wonder about this is you're looking at an age time difference here. This obviously happened in the 70s. So maybe people who knew something aren't as social media savvy as they would be the younger generation. So could that information be lost just because of the time? Or there are some of these cyber sleuths per se that participate in these groups and trying to solve these cases. Are you hoping one of them will be able to help connect the pieces? 
yeah, we're kind of just taking a, a broad approach. So we have had that in mind that anyone that would know anything about this case firsthand would probably be in their 60s or possibly older. So we hit Facebook up a little more because that tends to have an older demographic. Um, we did use Twitter as well, hoping, you know, we connect with the media in that way a lot of times, hoping that, that they would help us out um, through Twitter. So those are our two main things. We also did um, a podcast, the Already Gone podcast, which covers a lot of local Detroit area crime. So just kind of hitting a bunch of different things. I know there's some, like you said, the message boards, there's a Reddit board on this. Um, so we're hoping one way or another, this is gonna reach the person that knows something. Sergeant Lehman, so far with all these efforts that the Troy Police Department's put out and, and with all the discussions within the Troy community regarding this cold case from 1978. How much traction has been made so far? Have, has information been coming in as a result of this effort? Yeah, we, we've been getting information. We've been getting tips. Um, we're vetting them now. We're also, you know, just doing, you know, the uh, old fashioned investigation, going back and looking at what's already been done, talking to people that were talked to in the past, um, looking at what type of new, um, you know, analysis we could do with lab with the lab. We have a lot of physical evidence in this case, so we're just hoping things will come together. And I, uh, because it's like you said, the, the technology has changed so much between then and now. I'm a fan of forensic files. <laughs> I watch that all the time, and how DNA or the new technology today is helping solve some of these old cases. Uh, but I also kind of wonder, I know how limited resources police departments have, and by opening this up to the public, and even uh, not just locally, but throughout the country, are you worried that you guys will get bogged down with bogus tips that could take away from your valuable time of researching and investigating the valuable tips that need to be uh, done? Well, we've never done anything like this before, so we weren't exactly sure what to expect. We have a manageable amount of tips so far, and we can go through and prioritize them with, you know, people that are, you know, the tips that seem a little more credible or relevant versus the ones that are a little more far-fetched and just work through them that way. Um, and like I said, we're also, you mentioned forensic files, we're working through that end too. So the case, the evidence um, from 1978, the scene was processed in 1978, um, with the Michigan State Police Crime Lab. Um, and then it was looked at again in 1995. Um, and now we're looking at it again in 2020. So certainly technology has progressed. So we're hopeful in that area too, that we could get that piece of the puzzle. Uh, Sergeant, I'm, I'm amazed that the evidence is kept for that long. And where is it stored? And is there the possibility that the evidence could break down into a point where it's no longer viable for today's testing? I mean, I'm sure that's possible. We keep um, physical evidence or evidence in a homicide, we keep it forever. So every homicide we've ever had in Troy, where we have evidence, we have it in our long-term storage. Blood evidence, so in this case, we do have you know some uh, trace evidence as they call it which is stored in a freezer or refrigerator depending on what it is and that's where it has been for many many years so we're hopeful that we'll get some good um, results that way as well by looking at that stuff again how is her family with this development and i would imagine you had discussions with them prior to making this public oh yeah so when we this is that was one of the first things we did was reach out to the family. There's three daughters. Um, they were young adults at the time of this. Two of them lived with Gail, um, and they were in their you know early 20s. So they were heavily connected to this. This was one of the daughters actually discovered her deceased. Um, this has been a big thing that weight, has weighed on them their entire lives. So I reached out to them, um, wanted to ask how they felt about us doing this, and they were actually thrilled because they like i said this didn't get a lot of news coverage back in the 70s they were they were more than willing to um, part participate in it so they've done some interviews and um, been supportive how did this case even come on your radar and uh, because i i'm, I'm sure it, you are blessed that you you're working in troy and for the people who live in troy and that it's not 
a city like Detroit where the homicides stack up. So they do remain with you. And when you have a cold case such as this, but it's from 1978 to how were you even made aware of it? So we, like you said, when we have an unsolved homicide in Troy, everyone kind of knows about it. It's kind of passed along. And when I got hired here 16 years ago, I heard from um, officers that, you know, were had been working here since the 70s about different cases that had happened. Um, this case I have known about since 2006. Um, and, you know, we've had detectives actually work on cold cases over the years. This is just one of the ones that was never solved and it appears to be still solvable you know it's there's different things that happen in cases this one um it appears there's a lot of investigative areas to go still so we thought this was a good one to choose try and put a lot of energy into it and see if we can do something good for the victim and her family i will say uh, so i've been following along on facebook and i have friends that are uh, into uh, like trying to solve these real life crimes and they follow Dateline. I was like, you've got to start following this. I think it's great what you guys are doing. And we remember it is a victim and she deserves justice. But I imagine, you know, her daughter was 25 when she found her. And I just couldn't imagine what that has been like and how that shaped her life and her future. So to hopefully be able to bring them closure coming out of this would be such a great thing if we could shift just a, a a little bit and talk about your overall police department and your use of social media you guys hit gold star level with possifer donut i how did you even come up with this and then when the first one got sick i was like oh my gosh i felt so horrible but you guys made a great recovery yeah, I think when it started out as a joke saying, hey, maybe we'll get a cat um, if you guys follow us on Twitter. And what we saw that people really wanted us to get a cat. This would be a great community outreach initiative for us. So we went forward with that whole process. The Humane Society helped us out. It just kind of evolved along the way. We found out it was a good way to kind of promote shelter animals and grow that partnership um, and just when Puffs or Donut gives out a message on social media, it's a lot more effective than just one of us doing it. Um, and it's really kind of helped in a weird way humanize us and help us connect with the community. And that aside, it, it is cute and it's adorable. Uh, but, but you do utilize the cat as well for putting out informative, informational messages. And there is uh, sometimes... You know, um, as you know, I worked, or maybe you don't remember, but I worked for ATF and I controlled their social media. We couldn't put out anything that was remotely cute or informative. It was all straightforward. I remember we had our canine dogs. I bought them Halloween costumes and dressed them up. And it was like, you can't do that. It was like, but the general public loves this stuff. But there was a thought process that it took away from the importance and the seriousness of law enforcement in general. How does your department balance those two messages? So Troy has always been really heavy into community outreach and connecting with our community. And we have not had a problem. I mean, that side, it was entertained in the beginning, especially when this took off. You know, we had to consider that. But we have not had a problem when we've had to pivot between a serious incident and a puff or donut. Um, and there will be times when we will kind of take a more serious tone and maybe donut's going to take the week off. Like we've had, um, you know, uh, officer or um, police memorial day, for instance. That's a more serious day. So we're, donut will take the day off. Uh, but we had, you know, the public has been open to it. They understand what we're doing here. They know we're out here working and doing our jobs. We're not just playing with a cat. So we've been able to, um, you know, we, it's been successful for us. And what do you think the message has been for the community? Has it helped you bridge that gap, especially even more so now than ever because of the sentiment of um, the distrust in law enforcement? Has this cat and your use of social media helped bridge that gap? Uh, absolutely. I mean, just to show that we're out there, we're humans, we like cats, we have things in common with the people that live in our community and visit our community, 
just that to show that human side it helps um you know to be all serious all the time all business all the time people have a difficult time connecting with that they're they're not going to want to follow you on social media just you know if you're going to be a serious officious all the time um social media is about that human connection and the cat strangely has been a part of it our dogs when we um you know show us interacting with them in a fun way that has also been very popular sergeant megan lehman with us on the oakland county megacast sergeant just another couple of minutes with you anything else uh, that it would be important for our audience to know from the troy police department or or other information that we haven't touched on today um no, no i mean we i think the last time we talked we were in the um covid 19 you know lockdown and things had really changed for us with um, things have gotten a lot you know really back to normal in many ways and police work wise so we're seeing a lot of a lot more traffic volume unfortunately we're seeing a lot of drunk driving substance abuse seems to be an issue a thread that runs through a lot of our um, runs um, people facing a lot of mental health issues we as a police department would just encourage people to reach out for help to common ground or the other resources in our community um, before it gets to the point where you know the police were called I mean we'll certainly help connect people with those resources but we do see people out there in the community struggling Sergeant uh, Megan Lehman with us here on the Oakland County Mega Cast with the Troy Police Department. We want to say thank you to you and all of the team members over there at the Troy PD. You guys are doing an amazing job in keeping all of us safe. I so, so hope that this latest um, initiative does work. I've been following along. I um, was real life sometimes is even more engaging than a movie and when you put the tidbit out about the daughter's keys being stolen the night before that just totally shaped everything and how you think about things in your mind as well so i'm really hoping that a lot of people will follow along troy police department's facebook page so that we can bring the family of gail webster at least some justice it doesn't bring her back but to know that the person responsible has been brought to justice will um, definitely give them some closure as well so our best of luck to you and thank you again for thinking outside of the box oh thank you for having me